ready? Is everyone ready? We're about to start. Okay. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Alexia Carrillo, and I'm a student here at the Santa Rosa Junior College. I'm also part of the Student Government Assembly as a VP of Advocacy, as well as I work in the Student Equity, de um, Equity Department here at Santa Rosa Junior College. I focus my engagement towards underserved students and closing those equity gaps. Through the Advocacy Committee, we decided to focus on creating a share of candidate forum for Sonoma County because we believe it is an important opportunity for students and community members to participate in the sheriff election. For the first time in years, there are multiple candidates running for this position. It is important to be involved and informed in order to ensure the future needs of our community. So how we're gonna do that today is we're gonna do a quick overview of today's agenda. So we're gonna start off with the candidate's opening statement. They're gonna have three minutes to respond. The advocacy also created a few questions that we wanted to ask the candidates as well and they're gonna have two minutes to respond. After that, we're gonna have the audience uh, Q&A where you're gonna be asking the candidates questions that you want and they will have two minutes to respond. Lastly, we're gonna be giving the candidates a chance to do a closing statement and they're gonna do five minutes to respond. And just a few announcements before I start as well. I'm gonna be moderating today. If you have any questions you wanna ask, uh, we have index cards under your seats. Um, as well as pens and pencils. If you, if you wish to ask your own question, write your name on top so you can call, we can call your name and you can come up and ask your question up here. The volunteers at today's event are wearing a bright green vest. So they're gonna be wearing these. Um, and then if you want your question to be uh, answered, um, just wave your question up and then the volunteers will be collecting them. Um, if you're getting extra credit today, um, we have extra flyers that we have here. They're signed um, and with our stamp as well. And as courtesy for our guests, please have your phone on silent today. Now I'm going to invite President Dr. Chong to make a few words. Thank you. Let's give Alexa a hand for doing it. I met, I met with her last week to discuss how the forum was going to go, and she had all the details worked out. And I said to her today, I said, are you nervous? She goes, yes. And I said, this is the first of many forums that you're going to lead, and I expect you to be a candidate one of these days. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> On behalf of our board of trustees, our faculty, staff, administrators, uh, and alumni, and the community, I want to welcome you to Santa Rosa Junior College for celebrating our 100th anniversary. 100 years of service to the community, that's quite something. How many of you in the audience attended Santa Rosa Junior College are currently going to the school? Raise your hands. Let's see, I love that. Let's get their name so we can get a check from them before they leave today. <laughs> Seriously, um, you know, I always thought the, jo the, sheriff, uh, the job of the sheriff in this county was one of the hardest jobs, and I think it is. But after the last few weeks I've had as the president, I think my job right now is the hottest job, maybe not the hardest job. But I really appreciate, I've gotten to know these three gentlemen uh, personally. They're all good people. And I think anybody who has the courage and the, and the commitment to run for office deserves a round of applause. Let's give these three gentlemen a round of applause. And I really appreciate them being here today because it gives our students and our faculty to see democracy in action. It's an opportunity to see what this great country is about. Anybody can run for anything. And you guys are here. I appreciate your courage to do that and the time commitment. It's a lot of sacrifice. So again, I just want to welcome all of you to here today. I'm going to be here listening as well. So I'm going to turn it back to Alexa. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chong. Okay, I also wanted to make an announcement. I know we had a few people coming in. If you need translation in Spanish, we do have two translators that will be here today and equipment if you need it. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with the advocacy questions and we're gonna go in order by last name um, first. So it's gonna be Mark Essek, John Mutz, and then Ernest Olivares. So the first question is, what was that? Oh, you're right, sorry, I missed it. <laughs> they have opening statements. They're gonna have three minutes. Okay, is there anyone doing timing with your friend? Okay, perfect. Is this, uh, we're gonna be able to stand up as we talk? Or are you going to want to sit down? You, typically, we, typically, we stand up when we talk. Is that going to work for the audio people? 
very difficult. Okay, we will sit down then, or at least I will. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Mark Essick. I'm a captain with the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. I've been with the Sheriff's Office for nearly 24 years, and uh, I've risen up through the ranks of the Sheriff's Office. I started as a correctional deputy, spent some time working in the jail, learning what a jail is like, learning how to operate in a jail environment. Uh, then I had some opportunities at the Sheriff's Office, and I took a hold of those opportunities. I went to patrol in 1996 and started as a patrol deputy, where I got my very first exposure to community policing. My, one of my very first assignments at the Sheriff's Office on patrol was working in the Roseland Community Policing District. It was a program created by Sheriff Mark Eide, who had a vision for community policing in Roseland. He handpicked a group of 12 deputies to work in, in Roseland so that they could better learn and understand the, the needs of that community and really embrace a community-oriented policing program. Like I said, it was a, a, my first experience with that, and it's really stuck with me as a theme throughout my career. The idea of community policing, the idea of accountability, and the idea of working with people in the community. Um, I think the three items I want to land on you here in our, in our opening statement, and we'll have more time to talk about them today, is my vision for the Sheriff's Office. I have three important things that I think you should know about me. My vision for the Sheriff's Office includes transparency and accountability, includes community policing, and finally, it includes diversity in our hiring. And I'll have a lot more time, I think, to elaborate on those, those items for you. You're a good timer. She's on it. Um, we'll have more time to elaborate on those items as we move through today. But I think you'll see that the difference um, in the candidates here today comes from actual experience doing the job right now at the sheriff's office, understanding the problems that we face, and having real solutions and real ideas to move forward. Thank you. Does this, can you hear in the back with this? So my name is John Mutz and um, I'm a candidate for Soma County Sheriff. First of all, I want to start out by, uh, you know, I get referred to as the LA guy and I grew up in Yuba City, not too far from here. I grew up on a ranch outside of town and uh, growing up on a ranch is a special kind of opportunity. And uh, my baseball coach in there asked me if I wanted to be a police officer. And I said, no, absolutely not. I'd had some run-ins with the police as a young person, and I wasn't treated very well. So I didn't have it in my mind that I wanted to be like them. But what the chief did is he set me up with his most charismatic, charming, friendly officer, and I spent the whole day with him. And at the end of that day, I realized I wanted to be like him. So I changed my major from agribusiness to criminal justice, and then uh, graduated, became a sheriff's deputy in Sutter County, and I didn't like the kind of culture that was there. So I went to Los Angeles and rose through the ranks there in every, every assignment you could imagine. My specialty was changing the culture within those stations and then restoring trust in the community. So I did that for 25 years, and I left in the, for the past decades, the two decades actually, I've traveled around the country being a resource for many parts of our country and how we restore trust in the police. How we actually change the culture so it really reflects the community. So I'm honored to have done that in all parts of our country and what I learned from a, an expansive amount of experience. <clears throat> so I'm here to bring that experience and that record is success, by the way, to our sheriff's office. Thank you. No? <laughs> I was waiting for you to say start. Good afternoon. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, uh, let me show, share with you a very uh, brief story of, as to how I got here to be running for Sonoma County Sheriff. Uh, I am an immigrant. I came to the United States at the age of two years old. Uh, my parents brought our family to uh, California uh, back in the, uh, oh, about 1960, to work as farm workers. Uh, we grew up near where John grew up, but we grew up in Calusa, not far from Yuba City, where we worked as field workers. 
Uh, and that was pretty much our destiny, our life was uh, that of, a, of an immigrant family picking crops. It wasn't until I was in high school that my father, uh, realizing that he probably should have had a better plan for us uh, as far as our, our futures and educations, uh, after my two older brothers and sister had graduated from high school, uh, he pushed me, he asked me, he told me, he says, you got to get out of here. He says, you need to leave this. This is not the life being out here picking crops. Uh, and he actually told me that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And I believed him. I believed him, and for some reason, I decided I wanted to be a police officer. I didn't know police officers. I didn't hang out with police officers, and I was afraid of them like any other kid was. As a matter of fact, I remember immigration coming onto our property and people running and hiding. Uh, but I pursued a law enforcement career. Uh, most of it has been here in Santa Rosa for nearly 30 years. I retired in 2008 before I uh, joined the Santa Rosa City Council. For the last 10 years, I've continued my public safety experience throughout California and throughout the nation, doing some of the important things that are needed here in Sonoma County today. That is helping cities to develop strategies to reduce youth and gang violence and to uh, develop strategies in improving relationships with, between law enforcement and the communities they serve. That is something that is very important to us, not just here in Sonoma County, but something that we're dealing with across the country. And we will talk more about that this afternoon as I share with you some of the ideas that I have on how we can make things a lot better than they have been here in Sonoma County between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to start off with the advocacy questions. Um, but this time we're going to start with, um, or actually no, we're going to start again with Mark Essek. Um, so this is the first question that advocacy um, created. In your eyes, what is the role of a sheriff and what do you hope to do if you are elected? And you have two minutes to respond. All right. That's a lot. That's a big question for two minutes. The role of the sheriff in our community um, is, is really important. Um, the sheriff's office has 655 employees and we provide law enforcement services for the un unincorporated areas of the county. That's about uh, just under 1,600 square miles, and um, we do that with about 135 patrol deputies. So that is, that is one of our major roles. However, the idea of a sheriff's office is, is kind of unique in that um, a lot of people don't realize the number one reason we have sheriff's offices in California is because the California Constitution requires that every county operate a jail. So really, the primary function of a sheriff's office is to operate the county jail. So the remaining uh, about 300 employees of the sheriff's office, about split in half, run our county jail. We have 24-hour operations there. We accept, by law, we have to accept every single arrestee in this county. So no matter where you're arrested in Sonoma County, you're required by law to be brought to the Sonoma County Jail. I often tell people we are like a hotel with a vacancy sign that stays on all the time. We can never deny an arrest to come to our jail. So that means we work with all the different law enforcement agencies in this county. Santa Rosa Police Department's just one, but we also work with some smaller ones, Cloverdale Police Department, Healdsburg, Katati, Petaluma. So we have these partnerships with everybody. So really the role of the Sheriff's Office in our community is to operate the jail by law and then to provide law enforcement services to the unincorporated area as a secondary measure. Really, the way I see the role of the sheriff's office in our community is through engagement. We build relationships with the people we serve so that we have that relationship, we build that trust, and we um, are able to rely on each other to keep our community safe. Could you repeat the second part of that question for me? Um, what role, what do you hope to do if you are elected? And my time's up, but what I hope to do if I'm elected is to uh, continue to work on those things, build our community relationships, and make our sheriff's office at one with the community, where you feel proud of the people that work there, as I am very proud of the people that work there now. Thank you. Okay, um, also to make it fair, um, since we did go over our time limit, um, we will be providing that for the next um, candidates as well. Um, Do you want me to repeat the question or? No, I'm fine. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the role of the sheriff and what will he do? Well, things have changed over the last 25 years on that role, significantly. That's why we're having an election right now. 
So the role of the sheriff is all that what Mark said, but much more. It's, it's the job of <clears throat> running the department in a professional manner, reducing the likelihood of litigation, which for the past few years has been troubling. Just with the Andy Lopez case alone, the county's in over $4 million in defending that case. That is not a defensible case. Not only is it costing us money, but it also cost us the trust of the immigrant Latino community. <clears throat> so that has to be reconciled. That's the job of the sheriff. No one else has that job. So what do we, wh how do we do that? Well, we have to have a sheriff that has not just a passive role with the immigrant Latino community, he has an active role. He has an affinity for the community. So our job is to connect with them, run the office like it should be run in the first place, take care of the flaws and the breakdowns that have occurred that cost us money, and restore trust in the office. And yes, the jail is nowhere near like a hotel, believe me. It is not. Nowhere near like a hotel. It's a, pro it's a problem location that is, that is at the seat of litigation right now. You can view that on the internet. It's troubling. So listen, we have a lot of work to do. And two and a half minutes doesn't give us enough time for me to list all the things that we have to do. I assure you, we have, we have to seize the opportunity we have to change the course of this sheriff's office and really put it on the right track with the democratic values that we have in this county that we all, that we all, we all embrace. So I'm excited about this opportunity, thank you. For me, the role of a sheriff is, is vast. It's almost unending. Uh, you are a community leader. Uh, the law enforcement part of the job is just a very narrow focus of it. Uh, it's just, uh, and for now, it's more of a silo. Uh, really the role of the sheriff is to lead the organization, to provide direction, to set the tone for the, for the organization, to be that person that is connecting with the community. It's the person who is embedding, embedding a philosophy of community policing within the entire organization, not just a program at an office in Roseland area. This, ha this is something that has to be done throughout the organization. It's how the sheriff, it's the sheriff's role in how he supports broader initiatives throughout the county. How does the sheriff support education? Because ed Education, for example, is one of the things that many communities have found that reduces crime. We find very, very, very few gang members out in the streets, for example, committing crimes with four-year degrees. It's the equalizer. They're, they're more successful, they get jobs, they're highly educated, and they're successful in life because we care about them. A sheriff also plays a role in supporting other initiatives like health. We, can, we need to work together to develop healthy communities as well. It's not just about the law enforcement aspect of the job. It's understanding what the risks are out, out there. How, how do we mitigate risk? How do we mitigate risk inside the organization, which is also important? And John has brought up some of the troubles that they've had at the sheriff's office now with current litigation within the jail and, and throughout as well. Those are very important things for us to do. Uh, the diversity issues, looking for diversity, these are things that should have already been going on at the sheriff's office. It is not okay for somebody to run for sheriff and then suddenly say, well, now I care about community policing. Now I care about diversity. Now I care about transparency. This is something that needs to be ongoing. It's something that, that only you see because you are the ones that can tell me whether or not we're being transparent. You are the ones that are telling me whether or not that organization looks welcoming to somebody who's of color, a female, or anybody else, somebody who's uh, 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 transsexual, whatever the case may be. That they, we have to set the tone that that is a welcoming place to work by being inclusive. And, and that's what I value about organizations like SRJC because I believe that this is a good example of an exclusive community where everyone is welcome to be a part of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just also want to remind everyone that um, um, we do have volunteers collecting them, so if you can be more visual on if you want your answer or your question to be um, collected. Um, we have index cards on the bottom if you came in late. Um, and yeah. Okay, so we're going to ask the second question. Um, the first part is not the question, but I'll let you know when I get to it. 
On March 18, 2018, Stephen Clark was shot 20 times by two officers outside of his grandparents' backyard in Sacramento. As we see police brutality and violence rise towards people of color, especially black men, being murdered for simply having a phone out, with the local murder of Andy Lopez while the promotion of Gill House, and also taking into consideration the institutionalized racism within criminal courts. So our question is, what improvements will you make to the training programs that will help address racial bias in reducing violence against people of color? And I also wanted to ask everyone if it's okay if we extended the time for three minutes. I know two minutes was a little short. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, so we have three minutes to respond. Are we rotating now? Uh, yes, so okay. Ernesto first, and then John Mutz, and then Mark Essek. Okay. <clears throat> so, I, 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 I'm sorry, I need you to repeat that question, please, because it was long. So yeah, it is you, long. you made the commentary, but that, the specific question was what? What improvements will you make to the training programs that will help address racial bias in reducing violence against people of color? Thank you. I mentioned earlier the, uh, I think I mentioned 21st century policing. In 2016, President Obama commissioned a, a big group of people, professionals from around the country, to really study the issues of building relationships with our communities. And from that came a report, it's the, it's the President's 21st Century Policing Report. In that, there are a number of pillars that really focus on a lot of this work, and, and they vary. They vary from the ba very basics of building relationships. And, but, it also, but building relationships also means you address long-standing community issues. Uh, this country has dealt with racial issues for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's also a topic that sometimes we're a little bit uncomfortable talking about. We don't often talk about race. We tend to ignore that conversation. And the time to start talking about race relations and improving relationships in, in general as a community is not during a time of crisis. It's something that we need to do together as a community by working with the organizations that we have to have the dialogue, to have the conversation. And we have several here in Sonoma County. We have the Commission on Human Rights that's been doing a lot of work. And I was on that commission back in the 1990s when we were doing some of that work. We, we have the, the, the new office uh, that, that, we've, that was created post Andy Lopez that can help in that effort as well. There are so many people willing to help but it's how do we get to the people to the table to have these tough discussions because they're not going to be pretty. I, as the sheriff, need to be willing to stand there and take some of these difficult questions and address them because we cannot, uh, we cannot move forward. We cannot move forward. Nobody can unless we start acknowledging the issues that have gone on in the past. And if we don't allow that to happen, people will not be ready to start talking about solutions and how we move forward. But we have great opportunities to move forward even, even internally by the, the amount of training that we provide. We have vast hours and hours and hours of training, for example, in firearms. And, and that's some, but it's something that we do, we, we, we use seldom, but it is important. But I think equally, we need to have hours and hours and hours and hours of training in issues of de-escalation, looking for other alternatives of resolving conflict. Mental health is a very important issue. How do we recognize it? It's also having training on things like trauma-informed approaches to dealing with situations. Early childhood trauma we are learning impacts a lot of the things that we do today. And it's important for us as, as public safety professionals to become educated on what it is. What, what, does, what does trauma mean? Because even we as law enforcement professionals professionals deal with trauma almost every day, and we need to acknowledge that. So just doing those basic things, I think, are so important for our community to have these, these discussions and dialogues and doing it together with, at, at a certain point without having to point fingers, but recognize then that we all share we all share the responsibility to build more inclusive communities. It's not just the role of the sheriff or the police chief or the community. We do it together because it's important to us, and it's something that I've had experience doing by working with communities to address these tough issues, not just here in Santa Rosa, but across California as well. Thank you. Just before you start, I also wanted to mention um, yeah. It's the, it's the passion. It's the passion. <laughs> it's, it's hard to interpret passion. Okay. We will do what we can to slow it down. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I was actually going to mention that. We do have translation, so um, if you could be a little bit slower. Um, okay. You can start now. And, and again, uh, we'll do the best we can with the time that we have, because yeah. you know, we have information to share. Ready? Oh, yeah. 
Maybe you can help summarize some of the things we're saying, and that might be helpful instead of word for word. No? <laughs> so, first of all, we have, to, we have to admit that we can stop this trend. We can stop the shootings that occur in Sacramento. We can do that. We know how to. The question is, do we have the will, the knowledge to be able to do that? It takes the kind of experience I've had, not only locally, state, and nationally, to be able to do that. We can point to the practices that do that. It's being done. It just ha wasn't being done in Sacramento, and it hasn't been done in the sheriff's office here. So it's about training and a long list of very cutting edge training. <clears throat> However, if that training is placed on top of a culture that doesn't honor the sanctity of life, the reverence for life, no amount of training will change this. So it's about changing the culture. That's my specialty, changing the culture. <clears throat> so I want to make sure that we all understand that. We can talk about what that looks like and how that actually happens, because it's a very challenging, very challenging kind of thing. So the next thing I'd like to say is one example of we have begun to reward police officers who could have used deadly force and didn't. Can you imagine that? So we actually reward them. They had the legal right to use deadly force and take a life. But in those instances where they didn't, where they stopped and paused, we acknowledged them. That is a very powerful, influential tool. Now, to some, it seems ridiculous. I guarantee you it works. And I guarantee you that we have the law enforcement personnel that will adapt to that and be recognized. How am I doing for time? One minute. <laughs> Good. One of the things that we are in a position to do is to be influenced by the community in our policies. So right now, in Sonoma County, we have civilian oversight that's being attempted and being thwarted. Across the country, I can assure you that what it takes is it takes a top law enforcement official, in, the case of, in our case, uh, me as sheriff, to actually open up the office, have transparency, look anywhere to anyone that will help us improve. You can't get better without community engagement and improvement. That hasn't happened in the past. And where it has happened, in my experience, we've had tremendous advances. And we will reduce the likelihood of having another Andy Lopez. All right. All right. Uh, we will do our best to slow down. I, I probably am a fast talker as well. But it's nothing like having a timer on you on one side and then a slow uh, pace for the other side. Uh, we'll do our best. Um, you know, despite what you may have read in the newspaper or seen in the news, um, the, uh, the sparks that are, are reported to fly between the three of us as candidates is really overreported. Um, the, uh, the, the positions that the three of us have when it comes to training, when it comes to race relations, when it comes to uh, making inroads with our community and partnerships, we actually share a very similar vision there. We have maybe have some nuances, but um, I wholeheartedly agree with, with Ernesto's statement about building partnerships and um, recognizing that we have a race relations problem in this country. So those are important issues. They are issues that occur not only at the local level, at the state level, but also at the federal level. I think probably one of the areas that maybe sets me apart a little bit um, from the other candidates in this particular area is my work on the Cali Task Force. So after the tragedy uh, that struck our community with the death of Andy Lopez, I was appointed to be on the commission. Um, I sat on that commission for 15 months and really had the most basic raw experience of interacting with a community that was very hurt, very emotional, very angry. And we met once a week for 15 months. We examined ways that we could better provide services to our whole community and that specific community there in Roseland, uh, specifically Moore Moreland Avenue. And uh, we took a lot of criticism, and we took that criticism and put together a series of recommendations and a report 
that uh, we think has changed a lot of Sonoma County policing. A number of the items have been implemented. There are some items that were recommended that were not implemented. Um, some of them were because of cost. Some of them uh, were not directed necessarily at the sheriff's office or law enforcement. They were directed at other public service agencies. But I'm, I'm very satisfied that we are making good progress implementing those recommendations. Along with the recommendations, as, or as I already mentioned, the uh, President's 21st Century Task Force on Policing. They have six pillars there, and I, I think that we've made some significant progress. We're not nearly done in implementing those things. And then lastly, there's a group called PERF, which is the Police Executive Research Forum. And they are essentially the same folks that were on the President's Task Force. And they've come up with a number of recommendations as well. Being a law enforcement chief or chief executive, you always have to be looking for ways to improve. The status quo is never adequate. It's never acceptable. You always have to be examining your operation, the people you serve, getting the input from the people you serve, and trying to implement best practices. That's a commitment that I've had at the Sheriff's Office for the last 24 years. It's what's allowed me to rise through the ranks to the level of captain today. Um, it's a big responsibility in the chair that I sit in today. I work on policy for the Sheriff's Office. I work on discipline for the Sheriff's Office. And I hold people accountable at the Sheriff's Office. You may have seen recently that I was in the newspaper. I had to testify against one of our own officers who did something wrong. It was very difficult to do, but I'm very proud that I was able to do that because it was the right thing. Thank you. Okay, one more. What do you think can be done to reduce, oh actually, before I start, we're gonna go with Mark Essig, John Mutz, and then Ernesto Olivares. Okay. Um, on February 14, 2018, a mass shooting occurred at Majority Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 17 people were killed and 17 more were wounded, making it one of the world's deadliest school massacres. According to CNN, there has been one school shooting every week this year on average. As we continue to move forward, what do you think can be done to reduce violence in schools and the community? Okay. You know, this is a, a, a topic that I didn't have to deal with when I was in school. We didn't have mass shootings when I was in school. Um, I have a daughter who's 18 years old who actually attends Santa Rosa Junior College, and I've had some very frank conversations with her conversations I thought I would never have to have with my child, which is what to do if something happens at school. Um, you've heard the mantra, run, hide, fight. Um, that is kind of the national best practice right now. But running and hiding and fighting against someone who's armed with a full automatic or a semi-automatic weapon that can shoot hundreds of rounds um, a minute um, is not something that an 18-year-old girl should have to worry about while she's at Santa Rosa Junior College campus. So. Um, it's very real to me, it's very real to my daughter and um, her educational experience. I think some of the things that we can do um, at a local level and a state level and an, even a national level, but here locally in Sonoma County, is to strongly advocate for reasonable gun control measures. Uh, California has some of the strongest gun control measures in our country. Um, some of the things they're implementing in Florida, we've had in California for 25 years or more. But it's not enough, it's not enough, we have got to keep semi-automatic assault weapons out of the hands of people who would do harm with them. Uh, they are military weapons, they're designed for military, and um, I really do not see a use, I've, I've been a hunter all my life, I've never used an assault weapon to hunt, and I can't imagine um, that I would ever hunt with an assault weapon. So um, there are a number of gun owners in Sonoma County, I'm sure there's some gun owners in this room who know what responsible gun ownership is, they know about licensing, they know about how to use a firearm and how to train with firearms but we have got to keep them out of the hands of people with mental illness. We've got to keep them out of the hands of people who should not have firearms, being felons or violent folks. Um, so I absolutely would advocate on that. Finally, I, I'm doing okay on time it looks like. Um, finally, uh, training. Training is really important. Um, it's part of, the sh part of the Sheriff's Office commitment to Sonoma County over the last number of years, really started after Columbine. The Sheriff's Office has worked with the Sonoma County of Education and school districts throughout the county and even at the junior college level to work on training, work on training for staff, executive management, on how to implement safety programs at schools so that if we do have to face something um, as horrible as a mass shooting, we have staff that are trained, we have a plan in place that will help 
lower uh, our losses or try to prevent loss of life because um, you can never train enough, you can never be prepared enough. You always have to be trying to be ready for something that could, could happen. Um, we, don't, we live in a free society. We don't want to have this uh, school turned into something that looks like a prison with gates and, and all these locked access. We want to have a free society. So part of that cost is we have to constantly be training and ready um, to address something that comes in unexpected. So there's, there's a, it's a big issue. There's a lot of different ideas out there about gun control and making schools safer, and I can, plan to continue that dialogue as sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, we have to, we have to admit that we've been faced with this issue for decades, and nothing's changed. Nothing. So what's different now, though, is we have We Too. We have students that have, they're rising up and confronting the older generation with the status of our system, the status of our system that is, is broken in many cases. So the first thing that we can do is to support the We Too movement and take this student voice seriously and support them. That's what we can do, particularly as a sheriff. You have to be there. You have to support them. You have to be an advocate for them. And <clears throat> I'm hoping that we will be able to have that changed. One of the things in Parkland, and this is, this is consistent around the country, is, is there were many calls for help to intervene with this young man, and no one responded. The FBI, the local sheriff's office, the local police, they were all called. They all knew about it. This is no secret. He was a threat. And you heard the students said, this is no surprise. No surprise who did this. So we have to be more aware and more collaboration as a community. And law enforcement has to respond to each and every one of these. I was at Elsie Allen just a few weeks ago. And at Elsie Allen, uh, we have a very, very good relationship between the school officer, AJ, <coughs> and the students. And while many students at Elsie Allen don't like the police or are afraid of the police, they trust him. So he has a relationship with, with virtually all, all levels of students and teachers. So at Elsie Allen, and I'm using this as an example, where you have these solid relationships with, with uh, some kind of authority, either security or police, and there's open communication, we can identify potential people that are struggling, struggling to the point where they will use violence. And so we have to, we have to engage everyone in that conversation. Because if we don't, we won't be safer, we won't be more secure, and we will have more incidents like this. So I would just say lastly that we have this really great opportunity, and the sheriff has to be a steward of this. So listening to the students, engaging them, taking them seriously, and being there when they speak up. Thank you. How many of you have the opportunity to support our kids at the uh, March for Our Lives event down in, in uh, Courthouse Square? Thank you for attending that. I've attended two already. And we need to do that. We need to keep doing that. Uh, as I told the kids that day, we, we, we have failed them. Um, my, my oldest daughter is a school teacher. She teaches uh, first grade right now. She's been teaching for almost 15 years. My grandson, James, is going to start kindergarten next year. I worry about both of them. She doesn't want to carry a gun. She knows that's not her responsibility to be doing that, and I don't want to arm uh, school teachers. That's ludicrous. But we have an issue. Uh, but what I'm seeing is, is I'm seeing a mobilization, uh, a sea change being created by our youth that have said enough is enough, and, it, and they are the ones that are making the change. You are the ones that are making the change across the country by speaking up. It's you that the legislators have been listening to, and, and that resulted in that quick change in Florida. It, it didn't go far enough, but it started the process, and we, we need to keep that up. 
But there is that role of the sheriff. Again, the role of the sheriff is to lead, and, and that is to support that. As sheriff, I need to be there at Courthouse Square with them, supporting their efforts. I need to be helpful to mobilize community to be, to be angry about what has happened at the national level. I have an opportunity as the, as the sheriff to address my legislators, and I will do that in California and in Washington, so that they get off their ass and start changing the laws that we need to keep our communities safe. We need some reasonable gun control laws. We have been leading here in California, and we will continue to do more, but it doesn't help if the rest of the country is not doing that. They want to allow us to have legalized silencers out of the community. More guns isn't the answer. Even here in Sonoma County, Mr. Essex, uh, his, one of his responses is to allow more citizens, more citizens to legally carry handguns out in the community. What I'd rather do is spend some time talking about how we can reduce gun violence in our community. We, we started a very good program here in Santa Rosa back in 2004 through your tax dollars. It was through Measure O. And because of those tax dollars, we have reduced youth violent offenses, including gun offenses, because we are working at this together. It's not just law enforcement. We're engaging community-based organizations. We're engaging schools, and part of that is the school resource officers on what we can do to keep our campuses safe. And we need to expand programs like that throughout the county. Other, other parts of the county want it, and they, they need it. Uh, uh, Chief Sackett is doing a great job in Sonoma Valley. He's implemented some of the things that we've done here in Santa Rosa in the Sonoma Valley, but we need more. And, and again, it's all of us working together to develop the training that we need to try to reduce some of these issues. Things like gun buybacks programs, they're not gonna work, there's no evidence. We need to look for the evidence that's going to end some of this gun violence. And part of that is going to be, is going to, be to have Congress give us the resources, to provide the resources to do some meaningful gun violence research so we know how to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with Q&A from the audience. Um, but first we're gonna start with John Mutz, um, Ernesto, and then Mark. So this is kind of long, but um, after the passage of, S of SB 54, known as the California Values Act, collaboration between immigration and local police departments were limited. Practices such as sharing personal information like home or work address and affording ICE agents an office within local jails were prohibited. However, some departments like in Orange County have decided to make this information public as to bypass the newly implemented law. Can we trust you? This is a question. Can we trust you will make continue Sonoma? Can we trust you will make or you will continue to make Sonoma County practice of keeping this information private if you were to win your campaign? The direct answer is yes. Unless the sheriff has this position, we will not be able to make our county safer and more secure because we will not have the trust of the immigrant community. <clears throat> so there's no deviation from this. I said before the sheriff has to draw a line in the sand with the federal government over this. And that's, that's what we will do. My son-in-law is a dreamer. And I am very well aware of the challenges that he has. He's about midterm in his citizen uh, process, which you all know is, is ridiculous. And although he is safe right now, his parents aren't. At any point where they go to the store, they could be, they could be uh, contacted by ICE and go. So now we have SB 54. Well, guess who opposed SB 54? All the police and all the sheriffs. They all opposed it. Yeah. Now, so it got negotiated, and now there are certain crimes that uh, we will not, uh, that we will, uh, you know, cooperate with. For instance, and this is where we get into trouble, their convictions. So if You've been convicted for DUI, you could be deported. According to SB 54, the sheriff would cooperate with ICE. So you would send maybe a family, a father of five, back to Mexico because he had one drink too many and because he's been convicted of it? I don't think so. Is there a place where we have to really focus on dangerous people in our community to make our community safe? 
Yes. But many of those, many in the system now are under threat, and they don't need to be. We have to stick up. This, is a, this, is, this is, goes to our very values as a democratic community. We're Sonoma County. We are clearly defenders of our immigrant community. And why? Well, it's a decent thing to do, number one. They have constitutional rights to be here. And number three, they make our county run. They are, they are, at, the, they are at the hub of our county. So this is an issue that I'm not going to deviate, and we will clearly be a stand for the protection of the immigrant community. And SB 54 doesn't go near far enough. Thank you. As, a, as an immigrant, this is an issue that is very important to me. Uh, I know what it's like to come from another country to uh, learn New, a new culture, a new language. Uh, I know relatives who came here illegally and the struggles that they had just wanting to come here to, to struggle to make a living, it's, and it's very difficult to do. Uh, it, and, and, it's, and when you're in it, you, you feel it. That's why this is, this is something that's important to me. Um, but you know, when I did that, I, I, there wasn't a big welcome to United States sign when, it, when we came to California. It wasn't until last year Last year, serving on the San Jose City Council, we passed an indivisible city resolution, which was very important. And I hadn't given it much thought, but sitting at the dais up there and seeing the audience out there wearing the shirts that came in colored shirts. And I recognized, I realized that in the audience, very few of them looked like me. They looked like John here. They looked like Karen. These are our community members that said, we need this. And for the first time, being here in the United States, I, I felt welcomed. You know, it was, it was kind of, it's hard to describe, but I felt welcomed and it was emotional for me this, for people to say that we care about you. And, and, and we need to continue to care about people. Um, and yes, we now, have this, we, we now have a new regulation, a new law, which hopefully puts all the counties on an even playing field. Read it. Read it, because it does, it does delineate the types of crimes that somebody can be deported for. They're violent crimes, and that's important. But, and yes, there was opposition to it from law enforcement. Police chiefs remained neutral. The sheriff's associations in, the, in California opposed it. And there, there's a threat of them continuing to oppose it now because Jeff Sessions wants to mess with this. And the National Sheriff's Association is supporting his effort to undo it. You hit that? They're supporting that. And I don't know yet, and California Sheriff's Association is also a part of that, I don't know yet what positions individual sheriffs will be taking in California, but you need to be aware of that. My position is going to be, I'm going to support what is the best for our state. I don't care what Jeff Session wants. I'm protecting the people here in my community. This is where we can make an impact to protect those. And we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do in explaining the, the law to them so they can understand it. And as a sheriff, I'm going to ensure that our employees are out there with advocacy groups sharing with our immigrant community what the laws are, how to protect themselves, how to protect themselves in their own homes, and not to be afraid to come out, not to be afraid to go to the doctor's office or go to the, go to the store, or next month to go down and celebrate Cinco de Mayo celebration in Roseland. They need to feel like everybody else. And we're not there yet. I'm glad that we passed it, but we still have a lot of work to do here in Sonoma County, and hopefully throughout California as well. So we, all of us, all of us need to do the best that we can to continue to tweak that to make it the safest policy that we can. Thank you. Again, um, I think it's important to point out that you know we all, the three of us, have very similar views about SB 54, and um, there are some fine, there are some fine minutia and, and differences uh, in some of the finer points. But overall, I think the three of us all agree that California has spoken. California, through our legislators, through our governor, has spoken and, and said very strongly and very importantly that uh, we do not want local law enforcement interacting with federal authorities when it comes to immigration enforcement. And uh, as a lawman, as a person who's worked in law enforcement at the sheriff's office for 24 years, I understand that my job is to follow the law. It's not my job to be an activist, to disobey certain laws I don't like or enforce laws I do like. As a cop, 
Your job is to enforce all the laws equally and obey all those laws equally. So I think it's really important um, to, uh, to let you all know that if I'm elected sheriff, I will absolutely follow the law. Um, it doesn't matter what my opinion is, although in this particular uh, area, um, I share a personal opinion very close to what our state legislators have done to uh, prevent immigration from interacting with local law enforcement. And I wanna add that throughout my, my career at their sheriff's office, I have never, ever, ever asked someone their immigration status. It doesn't come up because our job as sheriff's deputies serving our community is to be there to take crime reports, to help people who've been the victims of crime, to provide information, to provide assistance. It's not our role to question people about their immigration status. It's very specific in our policy. It's been in our policy for at least eight years, um, probably longer, but uh, as far as I can tell, it's been there at least eight years, that it is prohibited that a deputy sheriff ask someone their immigration policy. And that is in conjunction with state and federal law and some case law out there. So we do not ask people their immigration status. I wanna add a little bit of information here. Um, John is a little bit mistaken when it comes to the, the dialogue and the specifics of SB 54. So SB 54 created a very specific list of crimes that um, are reportable to ICE. And those lists of crimes are violent and serious felonies. So you must be convicted of a violent or serious felony in order for ICE to be notified of, of your pending release from custody. Uh, John mistakenly said that it has to do with DUI. DUI is not on the list, so if you were to be convicted of a DUI in Sonoma County, you would not be deported, you would not be um, turned over to ICE. Um, it's very specific, they're violent and serious felonies. So uh, SB 54 tried to strike a balance, tried to strike a balance between um, some folks who were maybe on the right and were very strongly opposed to immigration in, uh, in our state and those on the extreme left who felt that we should have no cooperation at all. Um, so like any piece of legislation in our state, it's kind of a compromise, um, but I think so far we're on a, on a good track. There's probably some things that need to be fine-tuned in SB 54 over the next few years to make it better, but I think we're on the right track there. Thank you. Okay, um, I just have a quick announcement before we go to the next question. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to take those questions that are directly um, addressed to one candidate. It has to be addressed to all of them. Okay. So the next question is, and we're gonna start with Ernesto, and then we're gonna go with Mark, and then John. Name one thing you would change in the sheriff's office, and what would, you, what would be your specific plan to make that change? The, one of the biggest changes I want to make in the sheriff's office is the hiring practices, uh, and it goes to diversity. Uh, I, I want to include more HR engagement in the process. Uh, right now, HR is involved in a very limited term in that they provide the basic state test for new applicants coming in to be a sheriff's deputy, and then they, they are done. The doors are now closed, and the rest of the processes are handled within the sheriff's office with sheriff's office employees. Uh, and and wh what happens after that, we don't really know. Uh, I'm used to, and what I see across the country with, with communities that are changing their hiring and recruitment practices, is to have full HR engagement in that process to ensure, number one, that uh, an interview panel is diverse, that the appropriate questions are being asked of the applicants. I am seeing organizations and things that I will be doing, for example, is if the three of us here are at the panel, is there's, there's gonna be a fourth chair right here that's gonna be occupied by a community member that's gonna be asking questions with us as well. For promotional opportunities, meaning from sergeant and, and above, uh, that will also be a diverse panel of, of, of interviewers that will include uh, HR oversight. And the diversity of that panel is gonna expand outside the doors where I will be inviting uh, per, law enforcement professionals from Sonoma County and or outside, meaning I could be asking a sheriff, a neighboring sheriff to send somebody to be part of that interview panel because I want an outside perspective. Us internally, we know the candidates. I want somebody else's view on that as well. So that's gonna be important to me, an important change. Separate from that, when you are done with that interview with this law enforcement panel, you're gonna be going to the next room, and you're gonna sit in front of five community members. Five community members are gonna be asking you questions as well. And these are questions related to your ability to interact with the community. Give me some examples of you implementing community, uh, community policing strategies in your career. Give me examples of working with and, and, and dealing with, with tough issues. These are the kinds of things that I want from, uh, from our community members to provide an input because now we have a partnership. 
we're, we're, we're dealing with an issue which is diversity, which I said early on. It's not just the role of the sheriff's office, but we do it together. They also help us in that recruitment effort. That allows me a, a ranking of three to choose from. It doesn't mean I have to choose number one because they, they scored the highest. It means I get to choose wh whichever of those, not, not just three rankings, they could be ties, I could have six people. And I will choose the person that is the best for the organization today. Others may get a, an opportunity at a future time, but that's the way we do it. And I'm going to be making those decisions. I'm not going to, de I'm not going to give that decision-making authority to somebody else besides me. That means every employee comes to that office, their final interview is going to be with me, and I'll be making them that job offer because I'm going to own it. I will own it. So what happened with the deputy that was arrested and caught on video using excessive force? That's on me. And there we have somebody who had demonstrated some red flags before that was still hired and that shouldn't have happened. So I need to be really paying attention to that because that's so important to me. Thank you. I go ahead. <clears throat> so I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but um, again, um, Ernesto and I have uh, very similar views about that. Uh, the, the very specific thing that I would like to change at the sheriff's office is our diversity in our hiring. And um, I, I want to elaborate on a couple points that Ernesto made. Um, having community hiring panels is a great idea. Um, but um, I just want to set the context for you folks. We typically interview about 500 people per year at the sheriff's office for various job classes. We, we have a, um, some, somewhat typical in the, in the police services industry. We have about a 15% turnover of employees every year. And those are employees that retire. Those are employees that accept positions in other uh, agencies or uh, go on to go from a correctional deputy to maybe a deputy sheriff or, or some other position. So we hire a lot of people. We hire a lot of people. We interview a lot of people. And um, I would absolutely love to find a community member who would like to sit on an interview panel for 500. Um, if I could do that, I would be very grateful. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to find community members to sit on panels. Uh, but Really, I think, the, the, for me, the most important thing is to have a community member on a promotional. Um, I've sat as a community member on promotional examinations for other law enforcement agencies, other public safety, uh, school boards, and I think it's really important to have someone from the community sitting on that interview panel and having a, a say in uh, who, the future of that who the future of that organization is going to be. Um, so secondly, what I want to just make a point about is the current diversity in our hiring at the Sheriff's Office. I think it's really important that a sheriff's office or any large agency look like the community it serves. And when I say look like, I'm not talking about something as shallow as just the color of a person's skin or maybe their gender. I want our sheriff's office to look like our community in the experiences that we have inside. The experiences of a person who's gay or transgender, the, the experiences of a person who grew up in a different area of the country or maybe a different area of the world. And they bring that unique perspective because they've looked at their, the world through a different lens. And when we have more people in an organization that have a greater perspective of different ideas and different lenses and different uh, ways they've grown up, it makes us stronger. It makes us a better sheriff's office. And some of the things that we've done lately um, as, uh, as the administrative captain at the sheriff's office, one of my primary jobs is doing personnel and hiring and also discipline, unfortunately. One of the things that I've implemented as a, as a captain is uh, really seeking out employees at the sheriff's office who are top performers, mentoring them, getting them ready, and getting them ready for promotion. I'm very proud that um, of our five lieutenants that manage our patrol division, um, two of them are Latinos and one of them is an African American. We have great diversity going on in our middle level management and we have some, some diversity in our upper level management, but it's not enough. We need to continue working on that. So those are, that's one specific thing I would do. Thank you. I think the one thing we could start with is bringing uh, more experienced, knowledgeable, and steadfast leadership to the sheriff's office. You know, you have to remember that it all starts at the top. The sheriff is reflected all the way down through the ranks. So if that sheriff is one of expansive knowledge and experience leading change, 
then you'll see that in the organization. One of the things that we know has to happen today, and this comes from Yale Law School research, it says that procedural justice is the new measure for law enforcement effectiveness. And that is simply when a deputy has contact with someone, that they are treated with dignity and respect and have a sense of fairness, regardless of who they are. Because if that doesn't happen, the particular community person doesn't respect the authority. So how do you do that? Well, I've been involved in procedural justice training all over the country for a decade now. <clears throat> and unless you go out in the community and measure that, actually go out and talk to people, how, when you had the contact with that deputy, how did she or he treat you? Did they treat you with dignity, respect, and fairness? And once we accumulate that kind of information, for the first time, for the first time, we'll have a sense of community satisfaction with the sheriff's office. Right now, it depends on complaints. Guess what? Nobody complains because they don't think it's going to do any good. So leadership actually has to change the culture and make this happen. And be an activist. An activist is not a dirty name. An activist is someone who, who stands up for the issues that face us in our community. As sheriff, like he marches in DACA. He's there for we too. He's there for women's rights. That's the kind of activist we need as a sheriff. Not simply that will, someone who kind of steps back and lets the status quo work. You know what? The status quo doesn't work at all. We all know that. It's cost this county money. It costs us the image of the sheriff's office. And it'll continue to cause us breakdowns in all, in all sessions. And the evidence is just as plain as, as the hand in front of your face. It's time to change. Ready? We are, are we there? Oh, we're I, I started this done? round. Are we done? Okay, sorry. Um, so the next one, uh, we're going to start with Mark, and then John, and then Ernesto. Please address interactions between law enforcement and people with mental health issues. As jail often serves as the destination for people who need care and treatment, how would you improve? All right. <clears throat> Well, this is a question that um, is really in my wheelhouse, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's mental health and law enforcement is something I've been working on for over eight years in my career. Um, and it's something that really affected me early on in my career. When I first started working in, in custody in, in the detention center, uh, somehow somebody recognized that I had some sort of talent in working in the mental health module. And so one of my first assignments working in detention was in the mental health module. Unfortunately, our jail is the largest mental health institution in this county, bar none. Um, our local leaders and our state leaders have neglected our mental health system in this county and the state for years. We do not have the proper services for people with mental health, health issues. We do not have the proper support systems in place. And what happens oftentimes is that someone suffering from mental illness will be, come to law enforcement's attention for something as simple as maybe acting out in a store stealing a piece of food from Safeway, um, and they come into law enforcement's uh, purview, and they end up being arrested for a minor crime, and they end up in our jail. And jail is absolutely the worst place you can put somebody who's suffering from a psychotic episode or severe mental illness. Now, mental illness runs the spectrum. We have some folks who are really, really sick, who need medication, they need constant monitoring. And then we have other folks that have mental illness that they suffer, uh, that they carry, carry with them throughout their daily life, but they're able to function at maybe a little bit higher level. So there's a broad spectrum there. But one of the things I've learned in my years of working in, with those mentally ill in our jail, and then later on as a patrol person, is that if we don't have the proper training for our officers and we don't have the proper places to divert people to, they keep ending up in our jail. And it's really a sad state. Um, I think it's important to advocate to our local elected leaders, to our state leaders, that we need mental health services here in Sonoma County specifically, and we need them now. <laughs> um, 
two of the things that we've used is somewhat of a stopgap measure, and, and I'm, I don't mean to, to, to talk down about them because they're, they're certainly not something that I'm uh, disappointed with, but we have a program here in Sonoma County called the uh, Mental, Health, um, Mental Health Support Team, or MST, and that is a group of uh, clinicians that drive around in vehicles and are available to law enforcement to help them in the field. If they're dealing with someone with mental illness, it brings a person who's got expertise, who's got training in medi uh, medical and mental health issues. And we also have uh, a program here in Sonoma County called Crisis Intervention Training, or CIT. And I've been involved with CIT for about eight years. And what that is, is it's a special training that we offer to peace officers that teaches them how to interact with people with mental illness. But it goes much further. It talks about de-escalation techniques. It uh, teaches best practices. We have real life scenarios during the class where they, we bring in actors and the officers have to interact with actors to practice how they're doing. So I'm very proud of some of the, the progress we've made, but boy, we have a long way to go in mental health in this county. Thank you. So when we, when we look at this question, we have to look at what, what is happening. So we just recently had a death in Sonoma. It was a mental health um, issue. And we have to look at how that was handled. You know, Was the training uh, actually applied? What happened? Because a man lost his life. So, and there are are issues in the jail regarding mental health. And these are, these are being litigated right now. And the Sheriff's Office has done a good job of not discussing these, refusing to comment. We, unless we know the facts of these cases, we can't know how to prevent them. That's an issue of, of uh, transparency. Certainly we can train our officers to deal more effectively with people who are in a mental health crisis. That hasn't been done yet. In spite of all the effort that they have made, it's not acceptable. When we open ourselves up to the mental health professionals in our county, which we have a great crew of them, we will see success. We will see success. Listen, law enforcement can't handle this. They've never been able to handle it. You've seen the damage that it's done here and across the country. So the first thing we have to admit is, you know, we're not good enough yet. Nowhere near, nowhere near good enough. And we have to be humble about this and say, we've got a long way to go, and you know the definition of insanity. So we're not going to do that. We're not just going to keep doing what we're doing. It's time for us to bring in new research and new efforts, and we can do it, I promise you. I think just about every one of us has have uh, suffered some kind of a crisis where we've been impacted and not thinking clearly, made maybe poor decisions. And that does happen. Uh, to, with some, it's even more severe. Um, I've had that happen in my family. Um, but it is a difficult job for uh, our public safety professionals and law enforcement. You know, they're they're the cops, they're the detention folks. They're we expect them to be the mentors and the teachers and the counselors. They they do a lot of work for us. Uh, but again, that's not their primary job. I think the job has changed over time. We used to have jailers that would pretty much move people around from cells and take them to court, et cetera. But the job continues to evolve, and I think we need to continue to look at hiring practices and hiring people that really understand uh, these mental health concepts and how they, they can help people while they're in custody. A lot of this work is what I'm doing now in the context of reentry. What are we doing with people who are in custody to help them be ready for when they are released back to their homes and, and are they prepared? I've been talking to mental health professionals in Sonoma County that want to help. They recognize that we do have an issue in our jails as far as mental health uh, and the number of people that are there with some degree or another. But there's an opportunity while they are there to provide them services. And we do do that now, but I think there's more that we can do is how do we partner with some of our professionals in our community to develop programs that we can provide inside the jail to help them be ready to, to come out. 
and how do we identify other organizations on the outside to have supportive services when somebody's released? Because it's not easy, because once you're out, sometimes you're alone, you're back in the same neighborhood where some of the issues may have occurred. So we need to have more of a continuum of care provided for them who want it. And it's, and it's a shared responsibility too with, with us, the providers, uh, the individuals, and their families, because sometimes there, there needs to be a family member there to help guide them, because some may not be able to cope at it alo alone. But it's, it is difficult work, and it's something that we need to continue to do. And, and I talked about it before, training, 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 training all the time to be proficient in this area. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be hiring uh, correctional officers whose only desire is to move on to become a deputy. I want them because that's what they, they're calling this, is to be in a detention facility where they can be the person doing that. And, and I have, I've had the same concerns that John's had about these videos that are on YouTube, if, if you do some research on yard counseling, there's no de-escalation going on there. So we, we need to practice it time and time again. We have those opportunities is to do it all the time, not just some of the time. Thank you. Okay, so for the next question, we're gonna start with John, Ernesto, and then Mark. Since the fires, what is being done about alerting the unincorporated areas regarding our next disaster? Well, we're getting good media coverage about what the county's effort is being done. What we, what we, what we know and what we knew actually way before the fires is that there is a United States rural wildfire protocol that it's the best practice. Uh, but we didn't know about it here. So you all heard about the things that didn't go well with the fire. One of the things that went well was, you know, after about three or four days, there was information about it. The other part was, the, you know, the heroic effort that many uh, deputies did to get people out. But now the emphasis on actually being able to be prepared for the next one. And that's a leadership issue. Uh, I come from decades of dealing with uh, fires, floods, and earthquakes. And I assure you, unless you've had that kind of experience, uh, it is a mess, to put it bluntly. There's a lack of cooperation. So an emphasis now is on looking at what are the models that are consistently doing well in responding to these terrible incidents. For instance, Ventura County is known throughout the state as being a model for this. And so we don't have the expertise here. We found that out. So what we're now doing is we're looking for expertise around the county, I mean around the state and around the nation. And I assure you that we will be prepared in the sheriff's office the next time. A simple evacuation plan. You know, how do you get out of your neighborhood and where do you go? Where are the evacuation centers? Those all took days and days to put together. You know, I was at evacuation centers. And uh, I don't want to see us go through that again. <clears throat> and I want people to be able to point to the sheriff and say, you know, he knows what he's doing. He had us prepared. We were organized. We engaged the community in, in being involved. We had all the necessary resources. That's what it'll look like next time. And we're on our way. Thank you, John. I'm not ready to give you a, a, a list of things that I'm going to change because that is still evolving. I've already been involved in two debriefings. There's some very extensive debriefings going on throughout the county on after, the after fire reports to identify some of the uh, things that went well, some of the things that went wrong. And clearly some things went wrong, but not all because of, of the fault of any individual. It, when you have a major disaster like that, it is chaotic. It, it is massive and chaotic. And there's a lot of moving parts for it. it, it and it's not something that is handled typically by just one department within an organization. It's everybody, all hands on deck. Some people are doing jobs they never signed up for when you have an emergency like that. And, I, and we saw that with our county employees, city employees, and others, and they did a 
fantastic job of doing what they could with what they had and the information technology that we had available to us at the time. There's going to be a need for continued review to make some of those changes, though, and we saw some of that. We, we've already addressed some of the issues that uh, related to the warning systems. How do we warn people that the, the disaster is coming without creating panic? And we do know that there are systems in place for us to be able to do that. How do we develop a, a process now to have better and more uh, timely information going out to our community. Many, many of our Latino community were caught off guard because they didn't get information. They didn't, under, they didn't understand what was going on in the radio because they didn't speak the language. And it took a couple days, uh, maybe not quite two days, but finally uh, the folks over at KBBF, they went and opened up the station. They went on the air and all they were doing was copying what was being reported through KSRO and repeated it out to the community because we didn't have that planned and we should have. I mean, we have such a growing Latino population that we should have been ready for that and it caught us off guard. So we need to continue to look at, at, at this. And again, it's not for pointing fingers. It's, it's really, we learn. We learn from all disasters. Even in public safety after critical incidents, we debrief them to find out what went well, what went wrong, what do we, what do we need to change, what more training do we need. But we do need a lot of training. Uh, I have over 20 years of emergency operations training uh, in, in my career, and, and, and I know there's been some discussions about bringing the, uh, those responsibilities over to the sheriff's office. I welcome that. I welcome that with the appropriate resources to manage that, because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but you know, within the sheriff's office, we deal with emergencies all the time, and this is just one more emergency, even though it's more of a, of a natural disaster, if you will. But it could be anything else that's big that requires that magnitude of response from the entire community. Uh, so, so yes, I, I think we need to uh, continue to not just be patient, but also speak up about things that we saw that could have been done better. Because uh, I know that all of the agencies involved are doing that right now. They're gathering information and trying to uh, develop those new practices that we need, identify new training needs, and make the adjustments. Because there's going to be need to make an adjustments on who has the responsibility for doing what, so that we can do this better the next time. And I hope that there isn't a next time. Thank you. You know, I, I will just uh, leverage a little bit on what Ernesto was talking about there. We, we uh, as a community, are, are very prepared for flooding, right? We've been dealing with floods on the lower Russian River and in various parts of our county for as long as we've inhabited this county. Um, and overall, we're pretty good at it. We know how, we know where areas are going to flood. We can predict them. We can predict uh, based on rainfall where uh, things are going to happen and, and how to evacuate people. Uh, this firestorm was something that um, was really... Um, caught us all off guard. And we are really taking a critical look at infrastructure within the county and planning within the county, um, particularly among the fire and emergency services folks. You know, having worked, as I mentioned, at the sheriff's office for quite a while, um, it was really amazing to me to watch our staff come together during this fire. Uh, we had staff members showing up <coughs> in the middle of the night, fires burning. They were showing up to work. Uh, they weren't called. They weren't asked. They just came. Um, and we rallied uh, well over 100 people that night as the fire was burning, getting out, rescuing people, going door to door, because we had a system of notification in this county that failed. It absolutely failed. Um, we at the sheriff's office had a system of notifying people about criminal stuff and about alerts with the sheriff's office, the Nixle program. And basically, we reprogrammed our Nixle system in the middle of the night as the fire was burning, to try to get it to, to do different types of alerts. And you know what? It, it worked not very well. It got some messaging out. A lot of messaging didn't happen. And since then, we have uh, upgraded our Nixle program so that we now have the power at the sheriff's office to alert every single person in this county whether or not the fire department wants to do that or not, whether or not the emergency services people want to do that or not. I think one of the biggest lessons that we saw um, that Sheriff Rob Giordano, um, who, who led us so well during the fires, uh, he came into me and he says, Mark, he says, right now we do not have the keys to the system to alert citizens in this county. Those keys sit with one person and that person who works at fire and emergency services. And there's been some criticism about how that was handled and I don't, I'm certainly not here to, to critique that or pick on that particular person. But we said, we need to have a set of keys to that system so that we can notify people whether or not anybody else is on board. So within a day or so of the fires occurring, we had the keys to that system so we could continue to push out alerts and send alerts to folks, which I think was really important. 
We have been asked by our Board of Supervisors to take over fire and emergency services for the county because they saw what we did. They saw how we rallied people. They saw that we had a very effective chain of command. They saw that we had a culture at the Sheriff's Office of service, that our folks ran into the fires and put their lives at risk for others. And that really impressed the board. Um, so the board has asked us to look into running fire and emergency services. So right now we're doing a, quite a bit of research on how to do that and how to make that uh, work for Sonoma County. It will take resources though. Thank you. Okay. So for the next one, we're gonna start off with Ernesto and then Mark and then John. So for the next question, um, someone put Daniela C. Do we have Daniela C? You wanted to ask your question? We have a microphone going around in here. Hello, my name is Daniela, and my question today is, what is your definition of transpar transparency between this position and the community? Well, I, I, I guess the, diff the difference between? I, I, Oh, got it, got it. Well, transparency be begins here with what we're sharing with you. Uh, and, and I encourage you to, to do your homework and check that to make sure that we are being transparent with what we're saying. Th that's gonna be important. But it, it, it means a lot of different things. What I shared with you about the hiring practices, for example, is a form of transparency. We're not just doing the hiring process in secrecy. It's opened up by including community members. And no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna process 500 applicants in one day. It happens over time. And it's not just one community member. We can get plenty. How many people here would volunteer to help us out with hiring practices? There's people willing to do it. That's, that's the key. It's not the same deputy either. So it is possible to make that happen. Uh, and that's part of the transparency. It's also putting all our policies on our website. We, you know, sh show me the stuff. We, uh, Mr. Essek brought up earlier uh, the work of the task force and that some of the recommendations have been done, some have not, some are in process, some require funding. That needs to be on the website too. What is it, where, are, where are we in these recommendations? At what stage are we? How can you help me as a community member? What barriers do we see to being successful? We're getting closer to this one, but not that one. We need resources for this one. Uh, uh, we, we're successful in this one, it's implemented. And, and it also includes that feedback back from you because you are the customer, if you will. We're here working for you. And part of that transparency is asking you, are we being transparent enough? Yes, you are. No, you're not. Maybe, kind of. Where, where, where are we missing it? And part of the, many, many departments do that through surveys and focus groups by actually reaching out to you and sending out an annual survey to say, how are we doing in our community policing efforts and transparency? What, what are you seeing? And it's also gathering groups, whether it's youth, it could be seniors, it could be a variety of different people to have similar discussions, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations about what's going to happen next. And, and part, a good example of that right now is the cop show. The cop show is coming to Sonoma County. The Sheriff's Office is doing that now. At San Jose Police Department, they're actually meeting with the council members to talk about why this is important. And they're also gonna be meeting with, with community members. I think the chief, chief is also gonna be doing a survey to ask the community, what do you think? How should we be using this cop show? I mean, I, I have not gone to any trainings around the country, and I've gone to many, where they say, hey, here's a good one for you. Bring the cop show to your organization or your city. That's the best thing you can do for community policing. I haven't seen the evidence in that. And we all know that there's controversy over that, but maybe things have changed. Maybe there is gonna be a, a way of being able, being able to tell your story. But I think that we as an organization have a better ability to tell our story if we're the ones that are managing the camera and focusing on things that are important to us here in Sonoma County, not somebody who's at some studio someplace else. So th those are the kinds of things. It's, it's that regular feedback, not just at the time of an election. It's how do I give you that regular feedback so that you're identifying things. Can you go online right now and find an application or a, the form to file a, a complaint against a deputy? Good luck. Good luck finding it. Okay, so somebody was, well, okay, it's not available to me. Well, let me tell you where it is. Here you go, very first place. You can give somebody a commendation or you can do, do a complaint, whatever you need to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your question, Daniela. Uh, transparency um, really starts with the chief executive of a law enforcement agency, and it's that commitment. It's the commitment to be transparent. It's the commitment to get the information out there. 
One of the ideas that I have, and it's, it's not an original idea, so I don't pretend that I've invented this, but um, using community uh, advisory councils. So currently we have a community advisory council that's, that's made up of community members um, in two forms. We have a Latino advisory uh, council that re reports and works with the sheriff's office, and we have the citizens advisory council that's part of ILERO, and ILERO is uh, the independent office of law enforcement review and outreach. And um, those two different panels are there to provide input to the sheriff's office about a number of topics. Uh, we talk to them about uh, policy, we talk to them about ideas in policing, things they'd like to see, and it's really the first step. But I think the common theme with transparency is there's not just one avenue. It's not just a community advisory group. It's not just this one thing over here or that thing over there. It's everything. You have to take all the different inputs and to really form a, a, a transparent situation where you feel you're involved. Really, transparency means feeling involved, knowing what's happening at the sheriff's office or anywhere. Um, part of that comes in reporting. So, you know, I, I have to be a little critical of Ernesto because he's not really, he doesn't understand this and maybe he hasn't done the research, but. Uh, there is reporting on ILRO. So the ILRO task for the ILRO group <clears throat> puts out an annual report, and that annual report is part of the transparency that we're working with with the community. It talks about our hiring. It gives firm numbers as far as the number of people that we've hired, the, the different demographics they represent. It also talks about complaints that we've had against the sheriff's office, those that are sustained, those that have not been sustained. So there is a, a form there out there to report that information. But you know, I think it doesn't go far enough. I think we need to have, as a sheriff's office, an annual report ourselves. We can't rely on another agency to do reporting for us. We have to report ourselves how we're doing, kind of a community report card. And then finally, the, I do need to also correct Ernesto, and I, I, I give him a little room here because he hasn't been in law enforcement for a while, but we do have complaint forms at the sheriff's office, and they're very easy to find. They're both on our website, they're in our lobby, they're in every substation, they're in every lobby the sheriff's office has throughout this county. They're on your, you can pick one off your phone right now. It's both in uh, English and in Spanish. And additionally, we've worked with ILRO as an outside agency to help us funnel complaints. So if someone wants to complain and doesn't feel comfortable coming to the sheriff's office to complain because of uh, maybe some, some, some uh, issues they're having, right? Um, they can go to ILRO, which is, ILRO is this independent third party that will take the complaint, will process the complaint, and ensure that we get it. So there are many avenues out there, and, um, you know, you just have to do a little bit of research on it to find it. Um, but now I think Ernesto knows that. Thank you. Daniel, yeah. The, the question of transparency is a challenge throughout our country. <clears throat> in the last two decades, there's been very little progress in this area in spite of the, of the demands of communities to be more transparent. But let's focus on, let's focus on Sonoma County. So I have been in legislative <clears throat> committees where transparency bills have been proposed that would give us progress in this area. And guess who shows up to oppose that? The community? No. Law enforcement. They show up to stop this, and they have for two decades. <clears throat> we need a sheriff who will be an advocate for transparency. Why? It, contrary to what people believe, it doesn't jeopardize the safety of police officers. It actually makes them safer. It actually makes them safer. So we, we really have to debunk that myth, and that's the myth that, that, that's used. Listen, I, I, I'm an advocate for law enforcement officers who are doing their job and doing it the right way. And if they are, they have nothing to hide. One of the things that we can do is uh, when we have videos, you know, the body cam videos, we can release those, protecting the identities of people, but we can release them because then you get to actually see what happened. I mean, look at the Sacramento incident. That was released. I trained Bill Scott, the chief of police in San Francisco. And I'm proud to say he is an advocate of releasing those, those, those tapes as well. They help, they help inform. So we've had a first step in transparency with the sheriff's office with ILRO. By the way, it dates back way back to the early 2000s when law enforcement suppressed it. But now we have ILRO. It wasn't, couldn't be suppressed this time with Andy's death. 
but the sheriff objected to oversight. He didn't like the word. Why do you think he didn't like the word? Because traditionally, there is a bias against transparency. Good law enforcement, professional law enforcement, has nothing to hide. The majority of the time, they're doing a really great job. And in those instances where they're not, we have to be honest. We have to accept the mistake, accept the error. And in only that will we return, will we have trust in the police. So you can count on me as a sheriff as being a proponent of the transparency, but in a real way, not a, not a false way. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, for the next question, we're going to start with Mark, and then John, and then Ernesto. As the LGBTQ community and the transgender community has faced so much violence, phobia in Sonoma County, how are you planning to support and protect our LGBTQ trans community? <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, you know, recently we had um, some folks come to us and say, uh, can you please identify all the LGBTQ people that work at the sheriff's office? And um, I said, no, we don't, we don't track people at the sheriff's office who identify any of those things. We hire people who are qualified and committed and want to serve our community. And it's not our business to identify people who um, are, are gay or lesbian or queer. That's not our job. We want those people, as I mentioned earlier, to be a part of the sheriff's office because it gives us diversity, gives us a range of experiences, and it makes us stronger. But uh, the, the person who asked us was, can you give me a list of names? And I said, no, that's none of your business. And really, it's none of my business either. Um, I think that we, uh, we hire people because they're qualified. We hire people because they bring diversity and experience to the sheriff's office. So engaging with that community is really important to me. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Guerneville recently, um, and some of the, the relationships I've built in Guerneville with our gay and lesbian community is really strong, and I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud to have the support of that group out there. Um, they, they understand that the sheriff's office has always had an open door. We've always welcomed people from different variety of backgrounds at the sheriff's office, and they only make us stronger. So um, I, I'm very proud of the relationship I have with them. So I'll, I'm going to be really short on that question. Thank you. Yes. Well, this is a culture issue with the sheriff's office. Of course, no one's going to admit being gay and lesbian in the sheriff's office. There's, there's clearly a bias against the gay and lesbian community. So our work is our work is to really reach out to the community. So I I actively reach out to the, the the gay community here in our county because again it's a focus. The sheriff has to have a responsibility with the gay and lesbian community. <clears throat> How does he do that? By personal relationships with them, working with them, and showing up and letting them know he respects them. So also. Uh, I have family members. I have a brother-in-law who's trans, a queer. I have, I have a, a nephew who is trans. I have, I have what the social psychologists would call contact theory in this area, where I consistently socialize <laughs> with the gay and lesbian community. Why? Because I value them. I understand them. They're just like us. And you know what? They're a big part of our community. And they're waiting, by the way, they're waiting to see how this sheriff's office thing turns out. One of the things we could do is we could hire openly gay and lesbian officers. I just, talked to, I just talked to one in another agency. And I asked her, I said, you know, would you be willing to come to the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office? And she said, yeah, maybe if uh, we could make sure everything was OK there. And I said, I guarantee you, everything will be OK there. We, are, we, are, we will be an inclusive agency where no one will have concerns about announcing, about revealing whether they're gay and lesbian. 
That's not, that's not the case right now. So we have to actually have a relationship, an authentic relationship with gay and lesbian members of our community. Um, every, every month, I go to brew a local place here. It's a gathering place for the gay and lesbian community, the letter people. And I talk to them. I listen to their concerns and their fears. And, and also what they want to see in the sheriff's office. And if you listen to them and respect them, they will tell you. So we have some major gains to make here. My experience in actually hiring and supporting gay and lesbian officers has been phenomenal. They absolutely do a great job. So it's a real, it's a real treasure for us. We just are not there right now in the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. And it's always brief conversations. Yes, polite, but brief. We, we're going to change that. Some of you uh, may not know it or not, but we all have family members who are part of this community, even I. Uh, part of it is uh, inclusion, is how do, we, how do we build inclusive workplaces for our employees? Uh, and it's not a matter of having to ask somebody, but I have really enjoyed working in an organization uh, that has transformed since I got in there in the late 70s when things were much, much different. They were much, much different for a Mexican in the, in the police department. But to be in a uh, department where people are happy uh, and proud to talk about who they are, that is what I'm used to. And that's the kind of environment that I want at the sheriff's office. I have that experience going back to the 90s, working in, on the Commission on Human Rights, on dealing with hate crimes against our communities here in Sonoma County. And that was not OK. And I worked with a lot of organizations to help put a stop to that. It's, it's, it's how we carry ourselves and what we do day-to-day -day basis. And I'll give you an example. Uh, and I'm happy they're coming back. The uh, Gay Pride Parade, uh, we used to have that here in Santa Rosa going up Mendocino Avenue. It's coming back in June, June 2nd. I can recall uh, in my department having uh, employees come to me as a sergeant and saying, Ernesto, some of us want to march in a parade. Can you ask the chief if he'll let us do that? I said, absolutely, I'll ask the chief. I went and asked the chief. I said, chief, we have employees, some are gay, lesbian employees that want to march in the gay pride parade. And he said, absolutely. And if they want to, they can wear the uniforms. And I went back with that message to them. And they were ecstatic. And they said, Ernesto, will you march with us? Absolutely. My family and I marched with them every year that the parade was here in Sonoma County. Another example, as a sergeant, had an employee come to me and say, Ernesto, I need your help. And so what is it? Um, it's a personal matter, but I'm going to be transitioning from a female to male. And I don't know how to tell the police chief. I need your help. And I worked with this employee for a long time, a long time, who also helped educate me about what this meant, because I was really clueless. But we worked a lot. We also worked with HR. Uh, to, to make sure that things were in place because we did not know what the reaction was going to be. Because to be honest with you, the chief that we had at the time, I wasn't sure how he was going to deal with that. But going through this process, the employee is now, continues to be a very well-valued employee within the city of Santa Rosa, and I'm very proud of him because he's made this transition and he's now continued on to be a leader in that community to help others go through that transition. I even refer, referred my own nephew to him to help him in going through his process. Like I said, we all, whether we know it or not, these are part of our families and our community, and they deserve the same respect and dignity as anybody else. They need to be treated equally, and they need to be proud of who they are, even, even in their workplace. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, for the next, we're gonna um, ask one more question, and um, I would want to ask if we could do two minutes instead because we still have to do closing statements as well. Um, and then hopefully maybe the candidates can stay after to answer a few more questions. Um, so for the last question, it says, "Do you think Officer Gel Gelhaus should have been promoted after shooting Andy Lopez? Why do you think he was?" And we're gonna start with John, and then we're gonna go with Ernesto, and then Mark. <clears throat> so 
So I don't know Deputy Gilhouse at all. Um, but I'm troubled. I'm troubled, like most of you, about his promotion um, after, um, after the shooting of Andy Lopez. Because I'm troubled by that shooting. I've looked at that shooting, and I've looked at, I looked at dozens and dozens of these shootings, you know. They're all troubling, and, and, and the death of a 13-year-old boy, I can't imagine. I can't imagine what his mother went through when she got the call that he'd been killed, and it was a mistake. So there's a lot about Deputy Gilhouse we don't know, that I don't know. But I guarantee you that as sheriff, I will make objective calls about who gets promoted, who even returns to the field. Deputy Gilhouse was returned to the field after the shooting. And the community wanted him to not be returned. But he was. And you know what? The sheriff's office just stepped back and vindicated the whole thing. And then stood silent. Never even reached out to the family. Never even reached out to that mother to tell her they were sorry about the mistake. Can you imagine what it was like? So when we bring up Deputy Gilhouse's name, I have trouble with that. And I guarantee you I'll look at the details of that like I would anyone else. <clears throat> and I won't bring my bias into it. But we have to be troubled. You know, that is not the only issue here. There have been other, other horrific kinds of events that have happened over the last 20 years of the sheriff's office. So it's a system issue. It's a system issue. And it can only be resolved by changing that system. So uh, we've got some work to do. And I will definitely know more about Sergeant Gilhouse now uh, than I know now. That was a very uh, complex and impactful incident that happened to our community. A lot of people were hurt on all sides. And I gave that as an example before about how if we are doing a better job of of strengthening relationships over time, some of these flare-ups are less likely to ha happen or they may not be as bad sometimes. And I see that in cities that have been doing this time and time again where they have strong relationships, some of these flare-ups are less likely to happen. I know what I read in the newspapers, I know what I hear, I don't have access to personnel files, we know that. Um, but what I read in the newspaper, what I read the sheriff say was that he had to h hire him as a sergeant because he was number one on the, on the test. Go back to what I shared with you earlier about my hiring practice, practice, okay? Talking about the three rankings, talking about community engagement, having dialogue about is it the right time to promote this individual? So no, just knowing what we know now about this incident, I don't believe that would have been the case because I would have had input from a number of people to talk about this, including myself, which, and the, the benefit I would have, of course, is to, to know more about his personnel file as well. But I don't believe it was the right time for him to be promoted. Maybe he was promotable, I don't know. But it wasn't the right time. The assignment back to his area, maybe that could have been reconsidered too. We still had an ongoing crisis in our community that has not been resolved yet. There's, we're still in the healing processes. Sometimes it's a matter of timing uh, and, and understanding what is in the best interest, not just of the individual, but what is in the best interest of our community as we continue to heal. Because these wounds last forever. And uh, in things like this, people don't forget these <coughs> names. I mean, the, the, the name Andy Lopez will never, never be forgotten in our community. Okay, and, and when you say it, it sparks emotion and thought. So, so we need to be more thoughtful. That's why these hiring changes that I'm talking about are so necessary so that we're making the best choices for our community. Whether or not somebody says, well, yes, but he deserves to be promoted. He's been here a long time. He deserves it. We should. That's not, that's not good enough for me. It goes beyond that. Thank you.
Well, I have somewhat of a unique perspective on this because uh, I've worked in personnel um, and I was uh, privy to some information I can't obviously share because it's uh, confidential personal records. But what I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, the promotion of Deputy Gilhouse to Sergeant was put on hold. And the reason we put that on hold was for three reasons. Uh, we had a uh, independent law enforcement agency investigate this tragedy. And the conclusion of that investigation was that although this is a very tragic situation and there are many mistakes made, it was not criminal. But that wasn't good enough for us. We wanted to have another set of eyes on it. <clears throat> so we went to uh, Kamala Harris, who was our, our attorney general at the time, and asked her to look at that case. And she reached the same conclusion. Although this was a tragedy, and there are many learning points here, Deputy Gilhouse's conduct was not criminal. And then we took it one step further. We went to the US Justice Department, and we asked the US Justice Department under Eric Holder to look at the case as well, to determine if there was any criminal conduct on the part of Deputy Gilhouse. And then, after hearing back from them that there was not, then and only then did we as a sheriff's office promote Deputy Gilhouse to sergeant. And the reason I support that promotion is because we are a nation of laws and we're a society of laws. As I mentioned earlier, the job of a peace officer is to follow the law. So to not promote Deputy Gilhouse would have, would, would have violated his civil service rights, would have right, violated his rights under the California Employment Code, and it would have been the wrong thing to do. He was the most qualified person for the job. We waited until he was cleared of any criminal conduct, and when that, uh, we received that clearance, we selected him because at the time he was the most qualified person to be promoted. So I do stand by the promotion of Deputy Gilhouse. He's been an excellent sergeant for us. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the Sheriff's Office, and I can tell you that um, he is a person who understands community service. Thank you. Okay. So now, before we end, we're gonna start with the candidate's closing statements, and you have up to um, five minutes. So we're gonna start with Ernesto, Mark, and then John. <clears throat> Thank, thanks again for inviting us. Uh, I wish we had a standing room only here, but I know people are also in class and it's hard to get in <clears throat> here, but this is good. Uh, this is good that we're having some engagement from our uh, youth. There's some, some of us here too, but, uh, but it's good to have youth engagement. This is the third time that this has happened for us. Uh, we present it to tomorrow's leaders today, and as John mentioned, we, we present it to LCL and high school as well. These are people who can't even vote yet, but they are, they are the future, and we saw that with what's going on with the gun violence issues. Um, experience is going to be very important in this election, uh, and, and I heard some things th today that I need to really stress. Um, being the sheriff is more than just, I said this before, more than just law enforcement. You're an administrator and you're a leader. And to say that, well, we have to follow the law, yeah, we do have to follow the law. But as the sheriff, as a sheriff, I have the flexibility to help influence and shape laws that impact us here at the local level. I have to exercise that. I just don't take what's given to me. Even during the issues related to the sanctuary state issue, uh, the sheriff's associations uh, across the state were opposed to that. That's taking action. So why would, not I, why would I not take action on other issues that are important to us by continuing to promote uh, and ask for good gun laws that will help protect our communities? Why would I not ask that? You know, I, I ha have a role to make sure that our legislators understand what is happening on the streets of Sonoma County, that our kids are dying because of these issues, whether it's that, whether it's drugs, whatever the case may be, I need to advocate. The sheriff is also an advocate. I have to advocate for my community. I have to advocate for my immigrant community on the needs that they have. I have to advocate for my students because of the needs that they may have. That's why it's important for me to also support initiatives that create jobs in Sonoma County because that's our future workforce. That's why I support the, the, the class at LCL in high school, which is primarily Latino, but these kids are having a class. They actually have a law enforcement class there where they learn about the job because that's part of increasing diversity too. And we have a partnership with the JC where when they graduate, they have a likelihood to, get, to come on board at the, at the JC and at some point get into the academy and be hired. That's how we started making these changes. There's a lot of things that we can be doing. And it's important to know that 
These are the things that I have been doing. I have been doing a lot of work, uh, not just within the city of Santa Rosa on some of these issues of building trust and building safe communities, strengthening relationships. This is the kind of things that I've been doing around the state and nationally. I put on forums for others. I don't have all the answers either. That's why I work with a community of law enforcement and executives around the state to learn what's, what, what's working for you, what's not working. Let me, tell me more about that. I need to bring that information back here so that we can make some of those changes. That is how we make change. We can't, we can't le lead you to believe that we have all the answers. And we have to be transparent. We have to open up the doors for you. That has to happen, and especially with our Latino community. They need to understand how the Sheriff's Office operates. I, I am proud to say that I, was, uh, I, that I started the effort in having uh, bilingual citizen police academies at, within the Santa Rosa Police Department. I was also, as a, as a council member, instrument, instrumental in starting the first uh, Citizen Academy for the Hearing Impaired because they wanted access to. It's inclusion, it's community. We are a community, we make up the community, and, and my goal is to partner with you to build a safe and healthy community for everybody. And it's not just us telling you all the answers. We talked about the surveys and engagement. You asked about transparency. I can tell you what I'm doing for transparency, but if it doesn't look transparent to you, I'm not doing my job. I need to figure out where the roadblocks are. It, you know, we talk about perception sometimes, and perception is your reality. If, if I tell you that, no, crime rate is, is, is good, everything is safe, but you don't feel safe, I need to find out why. And, and really, one of the biggest things that I want to do is focus on our community's youth. Our youth is the future, and they're doing some amazing things, and we saw that across the country already. And shame on us for not doing the things that they're doing today. But we need to listen because these folks are going to be voting very soon. And so we need, we need to listen to that. Uh, but there are just so many changes coming. Uh, and again, it's important to note that these are the things that I'm doing. I know John has done some of these. And, and I understand that these are some of the things that, that Mark wants to do. But what has, why hasn't he been doing those? He's been working in personnel and hiring. What, is, what specifically has he been doing as it relates to building uh, diversity within that organization? He talks about going back to community policing. Why hasn't he been doing what has, he, what has he been doing to influence the executive staff of the sheriff's office to make some of these changes in his role as a captain? That's important. You have to be engaged, and you have to do what you believe is, that needs to be get done. Thank you. I'll tell you, uh, Sheriff Rob Giordano has been an incredible leader for us. Um, he was thrust into the job, and in August, on the job for less than six weeks, and we had a fire in our county that ravaged us and uh, really changed our way of life. And Sheriff Giordano did an incredible job. He did an absolutely outstanding job leading us with his transparency, with his engagement, with his vision for the sheriff's office. And when the time came to talk about the election, because we knew that we were going to be facing an election, I said to the sheriff, you know what, I, I will be your number one advocate. I will stand by your side, I will campaign for you because of the incredible job you've done. And he said to me, Mark, it's not my, it's not my job, it's not my place. I've, I've served my purpose here and um, I'm glad to, to fill that purpose, but I'm gonna retire and I'm not gonna continue as sheriff. He said, I want you to run and I'm gonna support you because I've watched you grow up in the sheriff's office, I've watched you through the, the, your career and he says, I know you're the man to lead the sheriff's office. You're gonna continue the great work that we've done in the last few years. You have a vision for the future, and you're gonna be that leader. And it really honored me and humbled me to have that endorsement and that uh, respect from him. So that's one of the reasons I ran for sheriff. But it's not the only reason. Um, I do have a vision for the sheriff's office. And as I mentioned earlier, that vision is about accountability and transparency. It's holding our people accountable, but also recognizing them for the good work that they do. It's about diversity in our hiring, so that our sheriff's office looks more like the community we serve. We build legitimacy that way. And finally, it is about community policing. And community policing is not something I just started doing yesterday because I ran for sheriff. As I mentioned earlier, I've been doing community policing since I got into the business back in 1994. So um, it is a philosophy, it's a mindset, it's not something you just do, it's not something you just say to get elected. But I think really what sets the three of us apart, and you've, you've heard from all of us today, and you've heard that you know, we have some very similar views on some of the major topics, but I really think what sets us apart, and I really think it's important for you all to know, because it hasn't come up yet, 
is that I'm the only cop up here. I'm the only person who's actually a police officer by the state of California. John's been retired for 20 years. He's not a peace officer. He has not been involved in law enforcement at the executive level or even the street level in 20 years. And I want you to think about how much has changed in your profession, the things that you do. And if you were to step out of your profession for 20 years and miss all that training, miss all the relevancy, the day-to-day -day operations, and then try to step back into that role 20 years later, not just as an employee, but as the boss, it's really concerning. Um, so I have some real concerns about John's lack of experience in the last 20 years. Um, I also have to bring up the fact that Ernesto's been out of it for 10 years. Ernesto has not been a police officer for 10 years. He's done some great work on the city council, and he should be very proud of that. But he also has never worked at a sheriff's office, and there's a big difference between running a sheriff's office and a police department. Ernesto is a mid-level manager at a police department. I'm an executive manager at the sheriff's office. I have that experience running a jail, I have that experience in running a $50 million budget, having 655 employees that, that report to me through personnel and through discipline. It's a big difference. It's a much bigger difference. So there are some differences between us as candidates. Um, these are both great men. They both done great work. But my absolute, uh, my absolute stance, and I implore you to really think about this, is they've just been out of it too long. They're not contemporary. They don't understand the current things that we're facing in law enforcement. I have that vision. I have the vision to take us to the future. I understand the things the sheriff's office does well, but I also understand <clears throat> the things the sheriff's office needs to work on. I'm the person who's willing to make those changes, and I'd ask for your vote. Thank you. <clears throat> well, <laughs> um, the sheriff's office has never met an outsider they liked. <clears throat> never happened. And uh, <clears throat> if you don't elect another sheriff, it's going to be just a continuation of 25 years. So uh, what have I, so I did 25 years um, and I was a station commander. Worked all the different assignments you can imagine. And then for the next 20 years, I left and I, I uh, met with the Congressional Black Caucus in Washington, D.C., Sheila Wright, Congresswoman from Texas, the staff of John Lewis. And I've met with people all across the country, and the topic has been, how do we improve law enforcement? How do we restore trust? I completed a book project called The Reconciliation and Restoration of American Policing. It's all about how we can change. I'm telling you, we're on the road to a restorative justice model, not a punishing model of retribution that we have now. That's my area of expertise. That's what you get with me. We're also on the road of distinguishing two different kinds of training. The training called the warrior cop and the training called the guardian cop. Now, there's a very short list of the Guardian training going on in the United States, but I can tell you a lot more about it. And it is not being done here in Sonoma County, I guarantee you that. But can it be? Absolutely. And you get to decide. It shouldn't be the sheriff's office who decides what's good for you. If you look at the last 25 years of this office, You'll see that it's time for change. And the people who don't think so are fixed. And they're in denial. Please look at it because we have a really great opportunity and we need to seize that. If we don't, we'll be left with what we've had. Status quo. And it won't be good enough. Because we'll have more people die and more people be injured and more people's lives be ruined. So I ask you to think very carefully about that and vote for me on June 5th. Thank you. Just before we leave, I just want to say thank you to Media Services. Thank you for the volunteers helping out. Thank you for coming um, to this event. And thank you, candidates, for showing up.
Thank, Thank you. you. And also, one more thing. If you're here for extra credit, um, Zach has flyers um, that are stamped um, if your teacher is asking for anything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes.